Hey there, today I'm talking to Sebastian Risi, who is the director of the Creative AI Lab and the co-director of the Robotics Evolution and Art Lab at the IT University of Copenhagen. He's also the co-founder of a company called Model AI that uses AI for various aspects of game development. Specifically, today we're going to talk about a blog post that Sebastian wrote that's called The Future of Artificial Intelligence is Self-Organizing and Self-Assembling. We're going to talk about systems that have no supervised instance controlling everything, but contain little elements that all need to somehow communicate locally with their neighbors to come to an agreement about the whole thing. Think of something like an anthill, just organizing in tiny parts to achieve a bigger goal. Now we've had massive success with these big supervised model, essentially a central instance controlling everything. And, and that works wonders for the problems that we're currently solving. However, if you think of things like the most complex organisms that ever existed, which is probably human society, Society, at least as far as we know, that is not supervised. That has no central instance except the Illuminati, but you know. So essentially human society is self-organizing and self-assembling, lots of little parts making decisions on their own, communicating locally. And what emerges is this absolutely beautiful thing. Now, as you can imagine, this is not mainstream, self-organizing and self-assembling systems and related things like open-ended and lifelong learning learning. These are not the current hype topics, but I believe strongly that they will be in the future. Things like this will play a big role when we push beyond the limits that we are definitely going to hit when using supervised and centrally controlled systems. Applications of this are numerous. I already mentioned things like game development. In fact, a lot of Sebastian's experiments are in things like Minecraft and other games just for visual, you know, oomph in their research. However, the applications are possibly unbounded and could touch every area of AI and the greater field of technology. So join me, this interview was absolutely awesome. You should follow Sebastian and follow his research and the research of his collaborators. Very, very interesting. I like it. It's out of the box. It's new. It's creative. It pushes beyond what I know. That is it for me. We'll dive into the interview. I'll see you around. Bye bye. Hello, everyone. Today, I have Sebastian Risi with me, who is a professor at in Copenhagen, working in the general field of self organizing and self assembling systems, which is, I think, an entire different world than the current paradigm that we're used to. We're used to having our deep networks training them really top down with supervised signals, sometimes self supervised. But I guess that's still kind of like a top down supervision, there's gradient descent, there's all these things where essentially an outside or outside us human or, or some, some constraint is globally enforced. And there's an entirely different world that goes much more along the lines of nature. And that tries to come up with structure from from the bottom up and that I find this really cool and is really promising. And I think it sort of can solve problems that are really hard to tackle with these classical algorithms. And I think the, the field is upcoming, even though it has existed for a long time, <laughs> but I, I believe that is definitely worth to look at. Uh, so today we'll talk about, uh, first and foremost, this blog post, the future of artificial intelligence is self-organizing and self-assembling, but also a bunch of other things in this field. Uh, so Sebastian, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Very happy to, to be here. So why aren't you working on just scaling deep learning more and more to bigger and bigger models? What's the appeal of going like really small, really, really modular? Right. Um, yeah, I think there, I mean, one reason is there are a lot of people working on or in this field. So, so I like to work on things where there, you know, there's, there's maybe not so many people working on it. And I find this field particularly exciting. Uh, and we have seen that uh, we can scale up deep learning and it can do uh, like amazing things. But we have also seen that um, these systems still tend to be quite brittle. So we have reinforcement learning agents that, uh, that uh, perform beyond um, Human capabilities in some domains, but then you add a single pixel in this kind of uh, in the sock in this uh, Atari breakout, and the system completely fell down. And there are a lot of other examples, like image recognition examples, where 
um, you slightly change an image or you rotate slightly and instead of detecting a fire bus, it's detecting something else. You have examples of Tesla uh, driving into like an airplane because it mistakes it for something else. So these systems are amazing at a lot of things, but they're still very, very brittle in, in other tasks. And so um, that's why I'm particularly interested in this kind of idea of um, collective systems and self-organization because these systems have this inherent kind of robustness. You can take away parts, you can add parts, uh, and the system will not completely break down because there's no central leader. It's like a self-organizing process, um, a collective system, and that's what kind of fascinates me. Um, and that's why I'm more recently, we're going a lot in this direction and, and it seems to be very fruitful direction where there's a lot of interesting things to discover that uh, we haven't really looked yet at. I think as a motivating example, we can show this thing right here which is a, a collection of what are called swarm robots, or here it's called a, a robot swarm. Could you describe what is what is happening right here? What, what are we looking at? Right, this is a, like, a great work from uh, Radhika Nakpal's group, uh, where basically they have these kilobots, a thousand of them, and and they uh, and they follow like a specific algorithm, uh, and that allows these thousands of of kilobots to assemble into a, a certain shape, like those shapes we see, are like a star, a K, and and I think this this wrench, uh, and and uh, and this system shows basically they only have very limited. Um, information these kilobots they can only basically see their surroundings but just by having this kind of local communication these kilobots are able to uh, over time to assemble into different shapes um, and and so this was one of like the seminal papers that showed that you can run actually these kind of algorithms inspired by nature on on a large scale on a large swarm of, of robots um, and and this is basically like one um, great example of this uh, what it kind of uh, what limited it is that those rules that those robots follow, like they have a specific plan, they needed to be designed by uh, humans. So it's a human-made algorithm. They follow it, and they can the, you can compile it into making different shapes. Uh, but what we are more interested in is can we do similar things, but can we instead learn these rules with recent deep learning, machine learning methods, basically combining this deep learning with ideas from collective intelligence to create even more complex uh, structures, growing more complex structures. This, I think, reminds a lot of people probably of something like ant colonies, um, also maybe uh, ev not, not necessarily evolution, but the development of just cellular organisms in general, where there's not really, well, I'm going to step on some toes here, but an intelligent designer, you know, di directing every step of the process up there. Is it fair to say that, that these things you said inspired by nature, is it fair to say that something like an ant colony implements one of these algorithms? Yeah, exactly. So, so it's inspired by um, what you see in like uh, swarms of, of animals, of insects doing like uh, ants. They are like amazingly robust, uh, and they have this kind of collective intelligence that is bigger. They are made out of like simple units, but together they do like these amazing kind of things. And termites, they build these amazing structures. And so, I think for this work, it's actually. Um, yeah, I think it was termites that was the main inspiration for this. And then you also have the same thing in, in um, the same kind of collective thing happens when uh, through morphogenesis, like when we are when we are grown basically from one cell by division and local communication, it's growing these like amazingly complex structures. Uh, and, and both processes show that um, by very simple rules, you can get amazing things uh, and and. Um, and there are many other examples. And, and one thing that these systems have in common is that you can remove parts and it still kind of works, which is very different to our current like neural networks where you change something slightly and oftentimes they will just break down. I think, yeah, you demonstrate this later by training robots and then removing limbs of them and they can still kind of adjust to it. And I think the, the, the arch example of these local rules you have also in your blog post, which is the, this game of life, which is obviously, as you said, these are hand designed rules still give rise to like a, a really complex set of phenomenon, which is, I believe, even like undecidable uh, to, to really decide from a starting point. I'm not sure about the, the, the lore behind Game of Life. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, there basically you can build any. I mean, with this, it's a universal uh, computer. Basically, you can build any kind of uh, program if you that you would want with the cell automata. Of course, it would be like a super massive cell automata. But they, they, as you said, they show that even these kind of simple rules they give rise to things that replicate, things that move across the screen, uh, and so people have found like all kinds of amazing structures by basically not changing the rules but changing the starting configuration of these kind of uh, cellular automata. Um, when, when we think about combining this with deep learning we quickly get to uh, these neural what they're what are called neural cellular automata. Uh, you have some examples right here and I think I have the the website open somewhere. This is work that appeared in in distill pub which is obviously cool interactive journal. So this, I think this was one of the first even articles to appear out of Google. Um, and so this here, I can maybe interact with it, you can destroy parts of it, and it'll kind of regrow it. And all of this is happening just by a local interaction. So there is no, there's no kind of global uh, organizing system that tells these things what to do. But every single pixel in here essentially has a feature vector and communicates with the neighbors and how they communicate is am I correct to say that the way they communicate with each other that is the part that is learned through deep learning exactly yeah you can imagine like you have basically a copy of the same neural network like running in each cell and that and that network takes into account like information from the neighbors uh, the neighbor state, and then it decides what should uh, what should the next state of that pixel basically be. And you have these like RGB values. That's one thing it decides on. But then it also has these additional channels, like hidden channels, that it can basically it can decide what kind of information would be good to communicate to my neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this work was not like the first that that used this neural. Um, that used neural networks to learn rules for cell automata, but but it really kind of revived the field. And what it did is that it showed that you can actually it's, you can make the whole system differentiable. Mm -hmm. So so we tried similar things before where we used evolution uh, to to optimize neural networks, which is this field neural evolution. Uh, but it's quite difficult for evolution if you have a specific target in mind, like you want to grow the salamander or you want to grow a certain other structure. It's quite hard for evolution to learn these kind of supervised tasks. And then basically this paper showed then if you have a target, you can just use recent tools like do auto diff, differentiate to the whole system, and you can actually efficiently learn how to grow a certain structure that is only grown through this local communication of cells. And that was one of the that I think revived like the whole field. And there's a lot more papers now using neural networks for cell automata to grow all kinds of things, game levels, robots. Um, is is how do you train such a thing? You said the full thing is differentiable, and there is a target in this case, right? Is yeah. it is it the is it the fact that you are in some starting state? Do you let it evolve for a couple of steps and then kind of measure the loss and then do something like backpropagation through time? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so you me you let it grow, and then you measure like, is it uh, how close is it to the to the final output, and then you, it gives you the error to correct it. And then they do all kinds of tricks like uh, that. You want the system to be, of course, robust. That um, if I let it grow for f fifty steps uh, instead of like twenty, I still want it to look like uh, uh, like a salamander. So they do some kind of they do a few tricks. Um, that that like doing it stochastically and letting grow for different amounts of, of time um, to 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 get the system to be that it grows and it also kind of knows when to stop growing because that's an important part uh, also in nature like if I if um, uh, like if through morphogenesis there's a, it grows an organ it should it should know when to stop growing that organ and and uh, like not grow forever so that's one important ability of these systems is to learn kind of when to stop. Um, if you were to, let's say, criticize this particular work, um, what would what would your criticism be? Uh, what's still missing from this, or where is it weak? Yeah. So this, what this showed is that it's um, basically it it doesn't. If you would critique it, it, you would you could say that it does not. But that was also not the goal. It doesn't uh, discover the the structure itself. It has a target, so it has some kind of 
human design target, like the salamander that is drawn by a human. Um, uh, and, and, and so in that case, that's one limitation. Um, so actually one follow-up work um, that we will be published soon, we actually combined uh, evolution and this system where evolution, we let evolution come up with like a, um, it's a, this uh, soft robot in that case. Uh, and evolution is good at discovering like a variety of different morphologies. And then we use basically this method to make the structure very robust. So we let evolution discover the structure and then we cut off all kinds of limbs and let it regrow. So combining kind of the, the creativity of evolution with this kind of making things robust uh, through this gradient descent based um, training. That is the, yeah, the, the work on soft robots. I've seen that. It just looks really cool. Uh, the yeah. things, so this would be one thing that is that is discovered, this uh, sort of kind of hopping tripod. Yeah, yeah. And, and obviously this... Um, I think soft robotics in general are rather new field and combining them up with like evolving systems seems quite appropriate. So here's one with a cutoff limb and you, it can learn to regrow, regrow it. Right. How in general, how do you teach a self-organizing system to regrow things? Do you have to explicitly program like you have to explicitly train it to regrow things or is this just a natural consequence out of how the system was trained in the first place yeah so sometimes it it can it, it often it already has some inherent robustness but it will without explicit training it will probably not be able to do this like perfectly um and and it will be that it sometimes works and sometimes doesn't so in these cases we explicitly uh, and also in the case of the, the work by Google, like they explicitly, like you explicitly remove stuff uh, during the training process so that you confront the system with, uh, you know, the, this kind of uh, this damage that it has to, to recover from. Um, so it is it, it makes the system more robust if you specifically train for it. And I guess in nature, that's probably one reason that the system had to work for all these different environments. So there is a lot of like it, they were um in your ant colony, sometimes you had more, sometimes you had less ants. So, so these systems are, because of the way they were, they are evolved, uh, they also show this kind of similar level of, of uh, or like superior level of robustness. At this point, are we already at the point where you would say that this surpasses or this is very advantageous to classical deep learning? Or are we still in the realm where, let's say, everything would be fairly possible with classic supervised top-down deep learning? Um, I, I think like this, um, it, it would be possible to have it grow and recover, but I think that the, the secret here is that it only uses local communication, basically. You could, of course, have a network that would... Uh, I don't know, a network that you query that would could like similarly to earlier work like um, C compositional pattern producing networks, CPPNs, where you query basically each location in space and you ask it, what should the voxel be? And of course, these systems could then, if there's damage, they could, you could ask them again and they could recover. But the trick here is, is that it's only based on local communication. So if we ever want these things to work in the real world, then it's really advantageous to have things that, that only require local communication, basically. Um, and, and so that's one whole, that's one goal is that ultimately we want to take those systems from also the simulation later on. And, and, um, you know, we have, yeah, we have some initial work and we want to really create complex things also in the, in the physical world. If you say in the, in the physical world, because if I, if I think of, oh, there was, oh no, this was a, this, the, the paper, um, the physical cellular automata is at least a thing that is doable in the in the real world but if i think of something like i don't know a tesla car or something like this that is in the real world yet it is still you know a central controller that controls the whole car and there is still top down and so on and is also trained in that way what are the types of physical situations where these would really 
the, the local communication would really come in handy. Yeah, like I could imagine, like, let's say you have a, a, a building or something that could automatically detect if it's damaged. And then, you know, it could like our, you know, our skin, uh, it, um, you know, it's damaged and it's, it's regrowing. It's, it's uh, self, uh, self healing. So you could ultimately, I mean, this is like science fiction, but imagine a building and then you, it gets damaged and then automatically it recognizes it's damaged and then it, uh, you know, um, automatically recovers from this damage. Uh, more other like science sci-fi is if you have imagine you have a, a swarm of nanobots they only can communicate locally right but they have to figure out their shape they have to figure out their um, uh, what they can do in an environment so in those situations this, this local communication would be very advantageous um, I don't know if it would necessarily be um, useful for these kind of you know Tesla the, this car example um, but but I could imagine a lot of other like application areas or drones that have to coordinate somehow together, only being able to sense each other locally. Um, uh, so more of these kind of in that areas. Uh, one thing I'm quite um, yeah excited about is this uh, get, getting this from like this 2D version to a 3D version, and then you can imagine building all kinds of things, and it would automatically know you're building a, you know a table or you're building a chair or you're building this and this, um, which which I think it's quite uh, so so this is one example also of um, so yeah the self classifying mnist digits uh, where basically the system can not only be used to grow something but it can also be used to in self infer its own shape so you build something out of small components or you draw like a digit and then by having the cells communicate with each other they figure out oh i'm part of an 8 or i'm part of a 1 and so basically this is then what we replicated in in this physical where you can put them together make digits and then each each of these cells would tell would figure out what part what shape am i part of so this um this is a physical instantiation of the demo I have here online. This is another distal article where, as you exactly said, these things, they figure out themselves what they're a part of. And you made, you made this, this is your paper, into a physical instantiation, which I find really cool. And now you're taking it to 3D, right? Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's the plan, yeah. And, uh, of course, currently these systems, um, like this kind of self-classifying MNIST digits, it, it does not work as well as like you're using like uh, like state of the art uh, deep uh, convolutional neural network or transformer or what 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 you have, uh, but but I think ultimately um, these systems maybe we can integrate some ideas also for things like object detection to make these systems kind of more robust by having a more kind of distributed object detection where you have this um, system where um, the components maybe it could be a combination of something convolutional and and uh, but then you have the system on top where uh, you have this uh, local communication and they figure out together kind of what shape am I looking at. And maybe that could make these systems also uh, more robust in the future. And maybe less prone to kind of this adversarial attacks that we currently see um, um, these systems still exhibit. Has anyone tried with like, maybe this would be interesting, like to take something like this and try to like make an adversarial, att I don't even know how that would look like, but something that a human would clearly classify as like a seven, but there's like a slight twist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm not sure people have actually studied it so much on this, uh, trying to, to see how, what kind of adversarial attacks these systems could, I mean, fool, like you could fool them. I'm sure there are also some, uh, but, uh, maybe the combination of kind of both this and the more classic deep, uh, image recognition techniques could, could make them more robust. Um, mm. So you've taken also this idea of this uh, 2D um, cellular automata and you've applied this in 3D here in, in Minecraft, which, uh, so this is a morpho, morphogenesis. How, do you, how would you define morphogenesis just quickly? Yeah, I, I would define morphogenesis as uh, like growing a complex structure based also on this kind of local communication. So how our like bodies are grown is, is morphogenesis, how our like organs are grown, how our nervous systems is grown basically uh, from like, uh, you know, a single starting cell. Uh, and so this is what we do here. And again, the structures are not found by the system itself. Like we took like an existing apartment building uh, and then we trained the system in the same supervised way to regrow it, basically. Um, and we were surprised that it could also grow like these kind of functional machines. We actually had it growing like like this temple. And then we found that the trap in this 
temple still worked. Uh, so because it, it had all the components, like there was not a, one single mistake and that allowed these kind of functional things to still, to still work like this kind of, um, like caterpillar you see there. And can you, can you, you, you also said you can destroy part of it and it will regrow, Right. which, yeah. Is this, have you made this playable somewhere in Minecraft itself, or is this just purely your yeah, demo it's currently it's it's not i mean you can download the code and stuff but it's not that we have a server where you can play with those things but it would be very interesting we actually we, we organized this um uh, minecraft open-endedness competition where we like a related field like can you have an algorithm that cr can like natural evolution create all kinds of novel things without limits uh, and that's also where we use this minecraft uh, framework um, but it would be real fun. Like one thing that I uh, that I want to try to also pursue in the future. Imagine you don't have it grow like caterpillars, but you have it grow like cities. And then depending on the environment that you as the human des decide, like the mountains or like uh, the desert, it would grow a different type of city. Uh, so 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 like that's one thing we're looking at now. How can you incorporate? also feedback back into the algorithm because this caterpillar will always grow the same caterpillar but if if i put this caterpillar in a in a in a small box it should maybe grow a small caterpillar and if it's a large box it should grow a large caterpillar so how can you kind of incorporate this environmental feedback um that's another thing that i'm um very uh, curious about yeah is do you see beyond beyond gaming maybe which which i can definitely see applications of this do you see applications uh, that are not in the physical world as we talked before, but but maybe in the in the still in the realm of the digital world. Um, are there applications? I don't know what 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 all you you're thinking of, but uh, distributed applications, networking applications, any sort of things that you're very excited about that maybe aren't super obvious if you just see the the Minecraft example. Right. I mean, one thing that we are. Basically, I think like two things. One is like just this Minecraft, I think, could also ultimately teach us something about uh, uh, biology itself. So, so if we because we don't know everything yet about how this exact morphogenesis process works in nature. I mean, we know a lot of things, but we don't know, for example, how is it so accurate? Like, and 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 uh, so so there are certain things that that we are we are, we don't know yet. And so by simulating these process like a very simplified model, but maybe there are things we can learn from these kind of very simple models. Uh, so that's one one area I'm also very excited about, and and um, uh, so so taking these systems to to as a as a very simplified models biology to learn something. Um, the other thing, the other application area um, is uh, what I'm excited about is using those things, but instead of growing Minecraft structures, you can grow actually artificial neural networks. So 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 you're basically kind of replicating our brains are not like designed and fixed they are grown like through this developmental process so what what we did with this uh, recent work this hyper nca is taken basically instead of having growing um, a caterpillar we grow uh, a pattern and then we then we with a neural cell automata and then we convert that pattern into a policy network and that policy network then is uh, we can use this for our rl task for example um, so that's one one area I'm very excited about, and making these systems more more um, performant. Because currently we apply to quite simple problems, but I think ultimately this kind of idea of uh, this growing neural networks uh, is could be very powerful because it, that's how you know our brains are are, are created. So 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 uh, we're trying to replicate that process, uh, hoping to create also more more adaptive basically neural networks. What do I gain out of, so in this here, I have these uh, developmental steps on the left. I do, I essentially start with some configuration of weights essentially. And then I let the cellular automata run for a number of steps, self-organizing here. And then I take it into a network and then I execute the network. And presumably I have to learn this somehow. In this paper, what you are doing is you're using, if I recall correctly, a variant of evolutionary search, right? Uh, I could also, like, in, in whatever way I learn it, I, I somehow have to learn how the cellular automata here uh, reacts. What do I gain out of this instead of just training my policy network? Right. So, so far, I would say it's the, 
uh, you, you don't gain so much directly. So, so far this method is not that they outperform like current uh, deep RL methods. Uh, but ultimately, basically there is this, um, uh, this hypothesis uh, also popularized more recently by Tony Zador, this kind of genomic bottleneck uh, hypothesis. That means that we only have, you know, 20,000 genes and they, they, they guide the growth and self-organization of our brains with trillions of connections. And, and, and so it's a much smaller genotype that encodes a much larger structure. And so this kind of compression is hypothesized to also allow us to and animals to deal with situations they haven't seen, like to, to basically that the robustness that animals show is part because they have to go through this bottleneck, this compression. And this is the information you give to the next generation. So there's some limit on the information you can get. So that might bias the system towards learning rules that generalize well, like learning rules that generalize well. And, and so this is the, the hypothesis here, that at some point we can have a very small neural cell automata, which is basically like the, the genome, and that encodes a much larger network. And that hopefully would then be more robust. Uh, but that's something we, we have, um, that's basically what we're working on, which we, uh, which we haven't really shown yet. But that's the, that's the hypothesis and the hope. Um, one other thing that's kind of funny that it can do, like it, it can, uh, you can basically let the growth continue and not just have one network grown, but multiple networks. So like, uh, and we applied this to this quadruped domain. So we had it grow for, for 10 steps to grow one brain, like one neural network. Then we put it into this quadruped. Then we have a slightly larger quadruped. Uh, so we let it grow for a little longer uh, and then put it in the middle quadruped and then have a larger uh, one. So And so basically one NCA can grow um, multiple different neural networks. And, and uh, that's also one thing that I'm pretty excited about that we want to apply also for like uh, more complex domains. And again, here you had an experiment with, with where you damaged these quadrupeds and it, the system is able to adjust. Can you explain how this system is able to adjust to a damaged morphology? Like I cut off a limb or something. Right. So here it was basically trained to on these, uh, like on all these different morphologies. And then we had it basically by continuing the growth, you can get a controller that was trained for one morphology. And then you continue it and you get a controller that, that works for M2 and you let it grow a little longer and it has a morphology for M3. So, so in this case, those were basically seen during... Uh, so in some other experiments, we have results where it has damage that was not seen during training. Here, it basically was trained to being able to deal with this particular type. So if we would damage it in another way, it, it probably wouldn't work anymore with these metamorphosis networks. Um, but um, yeah, so the, and the hope is also that if you know how to control one quadruped, then there should be you, that you don't have to start basically from scratch. There should be some information there that allows you to also grow something that is related and not having to start like all over again, basically. Um. This flows, I think, into a lot of a lot of ideas from, as you said, the open ended community and the sort of uh, don't don't have explicit goals community. Uh, I think parts of your blog posts and papers mentioned algorithms like quality, diversity, map elites and things like this, which are obviously very exciting and very different from how we do deep learning uh, today. So, so far, We've always looked at uh, things that have either an explicit goal, like here is the salamander I want to build, or here is the Minecraft structure I want to build, or have some sort of, a, I want to say, goal in, an, in a more abstract sense, like the reinforcement learning goal of maximizing the height in this case, right, for these robots that stand on, on top of one another. Yet, how do we go away from this? Is there... Is there a natural progression in these self-organizing systems to go away from having explicit goals that would be more difficult to pursue with like the classic deep learning systems? Right. I think in, in general, so I think that like two things, like one is the representation, which I think these neural cell automata are like a great representation for a lot of like growing structures, growing neural networks. And then, yeah, the other thing, as you mentioned, is like the, the search. How do, we, how do we actually get to uh, systems that, that, um, 
that show interesting these interesting properties. And and so there seems to be a recent trend. I mean, not just in these self-organizing systems, but in also in deep RL um, in general to not train on one thing basically, but train on a variety of uh, different things. So there was also this uh, more recent paper by um, I think it was DeepMind where they this. XL land that they showed like basically if you train agents in a lot of different changing environments they they, they become they develop more robust skills basically um, so so I think um, basically here it's we, we also we, we, the, what I think it makes these self organizing systems quite difficult to train is that these landscapes um, the, the fitness landscapes basically they are, they are probably very kind of uh, not very smooth because changing like something small uh, in these self-organizing systems can have like this cascading effect. Um, so, so that's why these traditional objective-based uh, rewards, uh, they, they work, but then they don't, it, it's still difficult to optimize. So that's why we're mo more looking into this kind of open-ended, like what you mentioned, quality diversity methods, basically where we're not trying to optimize for one particular outcome, but we're trying to find things that differ in some interesting ways, basically. Uh, and I think those methods, particularly for this kind of self-organization, um, they they are very uh, very powerful. Basically, um, in in that they they are better at navigating like these kind of very complex landscapes with many local uh, optima, uh, but they're also slightly more um, uh, expensive because they're they're looking at the larger space uh, of this of the search space basically. What. Um... Maybe these two questions in one. Uh, given given these outlooks, what field that deep learning is good at right now? Do you expect these methods to be better? If you know, let's say, if we invest the resources and figure out you know the the tricks of the trade uh, enough, w what parts that deep learning is good at now could these methods overtake deep learning? And then on the other hand, what's kind of the, for you, the most exciting area that we haven't even unlocked yet with deep learning that are accessible with this, right? So it's, it's two different, two different things, but I'm, I'm wondering about what you think about both of these directions. Right. Uh, so, so I think it's, it's also, I wouldn't say like overtake deep learning. I mean, we use basically, we use deep learning as a, as a tool. For yeah, to, sure. to basically like kind of train these systems. So, so I think. Yeah. I think, Sorry, I mean deep learning in like the the, the th just the thing we do right yeah, yeah. now, right? We have objective loss, right, right. Uh, supervised training, yeah. single neural yeah. network. Uh, so, so I I would assume that um, these systems would be able to have a lot of different domains. I think the one kind of probably the the closest I think what we would see is that they would make RL agents more uh, you know like more robust, more adaptive. Uh, and that's also already yeah, in this work that you that uh, we have there is like where we have basically um, uh, in this case we we trained uh, not only the we we have completely random weights and we only trained local update rules basically the heaven rules and then we show that through this system we can actually during the lifetime cut off a leg again we are always somehow mutilating these uh, these, these robots <laughs> we're not very nice to them uh, but but basically this is an example I think where where we already show that is this this is this is more adaptive than the current RL design. So, so in the current basically deep RL, I think the one main drawback is that we train a system and then we freeze the neural network and then let it do its task. So, and this seems like kind of very unnatural that like uh, you have a frozen brain. Okay, maybe you have like some recurrent connection that allow you to learn something. Uh, but but uh, basically we, uh, we have this training period, then we freeze everything in the system and we apply it to a domain. So that's no like lifetime learning in, in normally these systems. But the idea here is, or in general self-organization, that we never wanted to stop learning. We never wanted to stop adapting. We want the self-organizing process to happening the whole time. So I think in any domain where there are things that you might not have um, uh, anticipated during test time, these systems could be beneficial. Like might it be there's a pixel edit, you're losing a leg, or, or you wanted to do something else, I think that they already show that there's some, they can be superior in, 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 in those domains. Um, and that's one thing that I'm, 
pretty excited about to to apply them to more complicated domains, not just these like quadruped locomotion tasks, basically. Uh, but but anything where you you have something un, unanticipated happening, I think there there will be a, a, can be a benefit um, of it. Uh, and then um, was the second question. Um, like what other a new area that we haven't even like we have no chance currently of tackling with our tools uh yeah that's a great question um i mean i think this new area is this kind of rapid lifetime adaptation basically i think these systems are great for if you know what you would expect but things like basically like having things that work in unknown environments i think that's a that's a really um i think exciting area that i mean you you have like animals in nature and you uh, you you can put a dog into a new environment and will not completely like break down it will still know kind of what to do and to interact with the environment and we don't have that yet for uh, our agents like we can put them in environments they're trained for you put them too far out they they don't know what to do so so and and i think that too that's um so this working in unknown environments and also having this kind of like, uh, you know, common sense, I think is maybe also an area, I think in the future that these systems could be applied to, although I don't know exactly how, but but that these systems have more common sense and don't directly break down, like kind of giving them this kind of innate abilities that uh, we humans are born with, animals are, uh, are some animals are born with, uh, that allows them to, um, to yeah, uh, do a little bit more common sense things uh, than than current deep learning system that that don't have that property basically. And this, I, I think you you say it even here at some point. Uh, this, in addition to the fact that there is this genomic bottleneck, right? You you already said this. Uh, the genes encode or only have the capacity to encode very little information. And what we're doing here is we're learning essentially the rules to learn the rules, which can be compressed in a much better way than the rules themselves. And there is a reason to assume that this will result in that kind of common sense that if you have to essentially learn the meta rule, then that will make you generalize better. I mean, it's an it's an argument, I'm not super convinced yet. Right. But if you do then some parameter sharing, you show in some experiments, you can compress this even further. So that might be a way to tackle yeah. it. And also this, uh, in, in Tony Zador's paper, he actually he points out that um, uh, this bottleneck, like there's some uh, organisms in nature that have many more genes, for example, so maybe it is a feature that we have that number of genes, that it's compressed. And so, so that gives us like some hope that also ha having a similar feature in our artificial system should be beneficial. But but we still uh, we only showed that for very very simple you know simple tasks so far. And deep learning goes into the exact opposite directions, right? Where like the more the more parameters, the better. We have the double descent phenomenon, and and we can go essentially infinite, and and it always gets better. Which is which is weird, right? Um, which is also giving amazing results, I think, recently with you know the the whole language models and so on. So it's definitely it could it would be cool if in the near future people discover like a fundamental connection between you know the the good results we get by scaling up and the the actual principle from biology, which is seems to be more like compressing and scaling down, it would be nice if those were to join together yeah, somehow. Yeah, yeah, and hopefully, we'll, we can be part of that in, in uh, <laughs> contributing to to some extent. But yeah, I agree. It's it's really interesting that, uh, like that you yeah you scale up networks and then your local optima disappear. Like everything just works better. And and here we basically we want to go the opposite direction. Uh, but it, it's not necessarily that we. Of course, we still want our mo uh, the final models to have trillions of of um, of uh, uh, like connections. But we what we basically want is we want the trainable parameters to be low, and I think that that's the fundamental difference that uh, we have a small number of train or relatively small number of trainable parameters, that, but they give rise to much more complicated system, uh, exploiting things like self organization, growth over time, um, and um, yeah. This is, I think, 
because you said before you're not you're not an opponent of deep learning in fact deep learning is used inside of these cellular automata to to sort of learn these rules i find it interesting if you look in nature that there are cells and they self organize in some way right by whatever means that is learned uh but these cells then make up brains right and brains are naturally very top down planners they're 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 in the moment they you know look ahead and then the brains somehow organize into societies and the societies again are very distributed very local very interaction on a person to person level uh what do you what do you make of this do you do you think there is like an optimal uh switch from local to global to local to global that we could sort of stack on top of one another or is this just a happenstance of of the universe how it yeah, is yeah that's a yeah that's a that's a great question um yeah and even more like the the, the humans in the societies they organize themselves into hierarchies right, right? Yeah, <laughs> there's yeah. top-down control and, and, so and somehow on. it gets even crazier. yeah it's, it's a good question do we need i uh, want yeah do we need all of this in our artificial systems maybe maybe we need all of this to get to real like more general uh, artificial intelligence like because also one thing that is really crucial is the the our culture right like be, like if you, if you um i was reading this great book recently like if if you just put uh, humans somewhere by themselves uh, they are not very like um you know uh good at surviving but we are good at surviving because we mm -hmm. have all this cultural information like all this uh, knowledge that other people made that that we can build on and that allows us to do all these amazing things so so maybe to get our ais to do really uh, amazing things it's not enough to having in, like single agents in, in complex environments, but it needs to be multiple agents. They need to be simulated maybe over multiple generations, so there can be some cultural knowledge transferred from some agents to other agents. Similarly to how 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 it happens in in uh, for us, um, but of course that also makes the simulations much more complex and expensive. If you when you have to simulate cultures multiple like generations, and uh, then we'll, we need some more uh, better compute, especially at the university level. <laughs> I think yeah that's one advantage that nature has it has lots of lots of distributed compute available that said that there is there is an interesting part in your blog post where you describe sort of how to train these things um or how to steer the development uh of these swarm systems or distributed systems one one quote here you have is guiding a swarm system can only be done as a shepherd would drive a herd by applying force at crucial leverage points by subverting the natural tendencies of the system. And then another one is uh, the self-assembling brain knows no shortcuts in which your, I, I believe your argument was a little bit that it's very hard to predict what a change does until you observe it because the interactions can be kind of uh, non-linear, very dynamic, very, very hard yeah. to predict. In that was basically the argument that, that Hissinger made in his this great book, like on self-organizing, no, self-assembling brain. Uh, and, and basically that you need to basically, the system needs this process of growth and, and you have to put energy into it to observe the outcome. You cannot predict, uh, and that's also things they showed that Wolfram already showed with simple 1D cell automata. You cannot predict the the state of the system. You have to actually run the system, even if it's a simple 1D cell automata, uh, and that is also apparently the question is, do we also need to do that for to growing our neural networks instead of like designing them? Maybe we need to go through this kind of process of growth uh, with learned rules to to really unlock, you know, what these systems can do. Um, there is recent work in using, for example, GANs or so to predict things like fluid dynamics. And, you know, they can't do it like super like they're not extremely accurate, but they can give a pretty good uh, estimate of given starting state and then a highly dynamic nonlinear system. And then they can predict some steps into the future. I've seen, seen the same with like galaxy development and so on. Uh, do you, is there any happening like this where you can say, well, I don't, I can't, I don't have enough compute to run all these swarms, but I can sort of train a surrogate model that will give me the end in, in sort of a one-step fashion. And then these the, the, the forces that I poke at the swarm at, I could determine those using the surrogate model. Yeah, I think that that would be really interesting. I wonder, I think it's, 
it could work for some limited steps in the future but 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 i think you you would still need to you know like like at some point you need to basically run this this model i mean maybe in the first like generations you could help have sugar model that somehow helps you to sort out like the things that are really bad like uh, this will not grow into anything um uh, so, so I think you could use it there. Later, I guess you would probably have to to run the system like when things get more complex. Um, but I, but I think there's also another role for these surrogate models, which um, uh, something I always wanted to try to predict basically the learning abilities of these systems. So you have an agent in an environment. So maybe you don't need to simulate the whole lifetime, right? But you can have somehow like some kind of some test that would test is this agent how capable is this agent? So having some kind of surrogate that would could look at certain parts of uh, i don't know the neural network and already predict will this be a good learner or or not basically um mm -hmm. but um yeah it is uh in the la in one part you also it has very can very remember like i got into machine learning and graphical models were the hot thing at that point. It was like just before deep learning. And this reminds me, all this self-organizing systems uh, with the local communication, they remind me a lot of um, belief propagation, things like this. Uh, graph neural networks obviously are, are right now up and coming, let's say. Do you see connections between all of those things or is that just kind of a superficial connection? Yeah, I definitely see there's a big connection to these also these graph neural networks basically. Like, I mean, they are very close to like a more generalized form basically of like a cell automata where you have different basically neighborhoods depending on your the topology of the graph. And they also seem to be there. I think they're super interesting. Um, I also actually how I got into neural networks is the the first lecture I had as an undergrad uh, was actually on uh, neural networks and about um, these self-organizing maps, which uh, um, these co cohonen self-organizing maps that that basically can do clustering uh, um, based on uh, somehow like kind of like he means but on a on a much more. Um, they can do it better and, and you have these get these like nice visualizations out of them. Um, and apparently there's also some process in our brain. I mean, we have these topographic maps uh, also in our brain. So I was always fascinated somehow by these self-organizing maps. And uh, even though I did a lot of like some other things during my PhD, somehow now I'm coming back to this kind of self-organization uh, and, and, uh, and um, yeah, using these recent deep learning tools, it's, uh, I think we can really unlock like the power behind them. There was a, do you know the ARC challenge, the abstract reasoning corpus by François Chauvin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there is, I'm not sure if, if they have an example right here. So for everyone who doesn't know this, this is a task where you get, so the left ones are demonstration examples. There is always like an input grid and an output grid. And then you get a test example where you, you only get the input. So here, the rule is, I've looked at that before, so I, the rule is kind of, there is the gray in the middle and you kind of fold the, the right-hand side onto the left-hand side and then you the, the solution here on the right-hand side is kind of the, the sum of the two. And this is, these are things that humans are surprisingly good at, um, but are very difficult for a machine to learn and the this is a data set and the training examples there are not many training examples so there is not really a way to to learn this through brute force training there is a little game um, that people can play i think i've reported on this before but there is a game for anyone who's interested where this is the arc game you can find it on the github page on of of uh, alexei borsky and you can just choose one here. They're divided into different levels, and yeah, you can you can try them for yourself. So, oh, this this looks even familiar, like cellular automata. Do you think that it like self-organizing systems in one way or another, in the way we've looked at them today, or in the way you've seen them, could be useful in solving challenges like these? Because challenges like these are related very much to, let's say, 
something that we would call intelligence. Right. Yeah, I think the 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 hope would be that if we can get this kind of bottleneck algorithms to work where we exploit so I'm not sure it, like we could apply like self organization directly but what I could imagine is that we exploit develop these kind of genomic bottleneck algorithms uh, that can guide this self organization growth of a of a very complex neural network and that that network then could maybe be used for these kind of tasks and and the the hope would be that because it has this compression it would maybe uh, develop an algorithm that would allow it to, you know, solve these kind of, um, uh, yeah, tasks that that require more like high level cognitive skills. But uh, but of course that's still, yeah, we're still a little far away from that, I think. Um, and uh, I guess I I don't know what the current state of the art in in this task is. Um, how? I th I think it's cr I, th I think it's still largely unsolved. Yeah, yeah. So this could be a great test domain, I think. But uh, yeah, I, I think I, I'm not sure I have high hopes that it would already like, I think we're still probably missing some other ingredients uh, th that we don't have yet to kind of make progress there. Um, yeah, but by the way, this, I think I just clicked on, on one randomly, but I think here the, the rule as I think if, if people look at it, they can see that you always kind of select the smallest of the shapes that is there and kind of replicate it you know, I, I, at least that's my that's my hypothesis, right? Uh, yeah, may, maybe. I, I'm oh, not I even think sure. maybe you take the one that fits in the box. Or... Oh yeah, 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 right. Uh, but is like this 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 kind of like you need to understand what shapes yeah. are and so on. So there is very much that uh, this is very high level. This is very bottlenecky. It has a bottlenecky feel to it, like you're probably not going to get very far with like a CNN trained on these pixels directly. Uh, so that's, that's, I, I can see something like this, uh, very much, um, be in the domain of, of like first open-endedness, but then also self-organizing things made up like simple rules, making up something very complicated. There's, the, there's other, two other domains that I, that, uh, I think also very exciting. Like one is this animal AI benchmark where basically they, uh, it's like an animal AI Olympics where you apply AIs to tasks that animals normally are good at. Like, um, and like, for example, trying to figure out which one is the tool and then you use that tool to, you know, get a reward. Uh, and so this is also where current methods, basically, they pretty much fail on more complicated tasks. And then they also mm -hmm. had the experiments where they had children perform these tasks and they are still much better and then, then like any of our deep RL methods. So in the simple task, deep RL performs pretty well. Once it gets to more complicated things, um, then they, the system basically, uh, um, these systems fail. So, so this is one task that, that um, like uh, in the recent grant proposal that I proposed that, that that would be a good test domain for these methods basically. Because the whole point is to, to act in an environment that you haven't seen during training. Uh, even though the environment is made out of the same building blocks, like there's rewards, there's like uh, barriers, uh, but how they are composed, uh, uh, all of this is, is new basically um, and never seen before. Um, and the other one is this uh, also by, I think it was DeepMind, this alchemy task where you have to learn to kind of, um, uh, it's a task that we have to learn basically about the structure of the domain, what things you can put together, and then you have to use that knowledge to like building on that knowledge basically. And this is also a very difficult task for all of our current methods. So I think this could also be a very good task to um, to basically as the North Star to drive these the progress in, in this kind of area. And, and I, the hope is that this kind of self-organizing system, um, they should be, should, hopefully would be better at, in, in this. Where can people, if someone wants to get started in diving into the world of of self-organizing systems, uh, swarm intelligence, maybe a bit of open-endedness. Is there a good place for people to get started, like get their 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 feet? Yeah, wet I, I I would say I was recently rereading uh, this great book from uh, Melanie Mitchell, this complexity. I think this is a great starting book on on kind of these ideas of complex system self-organization. Uh, there's something about cellular automata in there, so I think this is a this is a good kind of 
good point to get a broader overview of of uh, of that kind of whole field of basically complex systems organization um and um yeah and hopefully the also the, the the blog post hopefully can be helpful to some people and i also plan to write more on on that as well uh but but this i would suggest this is a this is definitely a good place to start and is there um some some you know in in deep learning it's usually keras i train a cnn on mnist or cfar 10 is there like some some standard thing that every one of your of your students goes through i mean now i i send a lot of them to this great distill article basically and looking at this uh, this growing ncas because they also have a, a great um like this call up notebook where you can play with the system so i think this is a great starting point to where you both have neural like you have cell automata and you have like how recent tools can be used to grow them so i think this is a good good uh, place to play around with basically mm -hmm. okay yeah i've i've spent more than yeah. more than uh more time than yeah, i wanted yeah. on these things because they're yeah. quite yeah, it's fun. great that it's also so interactive <laughs> and um it's fun to play yeah. with yes definitely um yeah i think is there anything else that you would like to get out there to to people about this field yeah i just uh yeah i hope that people would be um not only everybody running basically in the same direction just doing like what everybody else is doing so so hopefully um uh, this will be also uh, get a few more people into this field of complex systems and and uh, self-organizing systems and combining the ideas of deep learning um, because i think there's a lot of things interesting things to discover basically here and and uh, there are a little bit less people working on it than um than the hard, like like working on foundation models and language models and all those uh, other things. Yeah. yeah, it's certainly, I, I think, I think it's certainly an interesting area. And I guess, especially if you're at a, a university without the super duper clusters, yeah. uh, probably just strategically a, a PhD in this field would maybe be more uh, of a advantageous yeah. position yeah. for new newcomers to and, the field. Uh, actually, like, um, Hinton had this great uh, um, quote recently on this um, uh, other podcast. Like, it's always a good idea to figure out what huge numbers of very smart people are working on and to work on something else. Uh, because you don't want to do maybe what, what everybody else is doing. Um, and, and I think so. I would suggest this is a great field where a lot of, I think, interesting discoveries basically waiting to happen. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, all right. So, Sebastian, thank you very much for being here today. This was very yeah, cool. Yeah, thanks a lot for the invite. And I, I hope to see, yeah, I hope to see sprawling future yeah, for your th field. Thanks a lot for the invite. Thanks.